The book is about um, this kind of, I guess, lesser known moment in 1916. Um, World War One was happening in Europe and the United States was kind of um, wrestling, debating whether or not we'd be involved and, and so the context is important. And um, all around the country there were a number of uh, parades and they were basically to kind of drum up support or patriotism um, for the cause. And there was a lot of debate in the country about whether or not we'd enter into World War I and, and it was really a divisive issue. And so preparedness was this kind of movement of we're not in the war but we should probably be ready if we are. And among a divided population these parades, and they happened all over the place, um, um, Seattle and Washington DC and so on, were again one of these mechanisms, one of these tools to kind of to kind of gin up um, support. So San Francisco um, was no different, and it had its Preparedness Day parade um, on July 22nd, 1916. And so the book is really the story of this moment, and it begins um, with this family from Oakland, a, a mother uh, and her husband, and their two young children, Virginia and Billy, making the trip in from Oakland um, and coming to the parade in the city. Uh, and they kind of found their spot uh, and so on. And not long after the parade began, a bomb went off. And so the book really starts at that moment. Um, the bomb is this kind of um, vicious uh, moment. Um, it takes off um, um, Mrs. Wymore's legs, the woman I was just describing. Um, the children and the husband escape, thankfully. Um, she later um, passes. Uh, ultimately, the bomb kills 10 people. And so, you know, it was this kind of optimistic day that turns very dark um, on the streets of San Francisco. San Francisco has a great labor tradition, and so the labor uh, element in San Francisco is really powerful. It's a closed shop city, and so uh, if you're not a member of a union, you know, you're not going to find work. And, and so there was a rich kind of labor tradition, and the preparedness parade that I just described had thousands of people marching it. Not one single labor union took part, and that was a powerful protest that, that labor, who for obvious reasons, um, uh, maybe not so obvious, but were some of the loudest critics of the war, um, uh, re were reacting to. And so that was a statement um, by the labor community that we didn't want to be complicit in this. Um, and the other thing I might point to uh, in San Francisco is there is a kind of radical tradition there. There is, of course, a more bohemian tradition in San Francisco. That's even more contemporary. But even in the late 19th and the early 20th century, um, that was true, too. And so one of the fun things for me was to look through old San Francisco newspapers and find, you know, uh, ads that the local anarchists were having a meeting. And so they just put things in the newspaper. Um, and they said, you know, our meetings will be on Wednesdays in Italian and they'll be uh, in Yiddish on Saturdays or something like this. And so um, quite in the open. And so that, that, I think, kind of speaks to the character of San Francisco, that San Francisco was a place where the radical community, you know, was alive and well. And some of the characters who were in San Francisco at the time were part of that too. Emma Goldman, who's a famous anarchist, uh, was living in San Francisco when the bomb uh, went off. Um, and she had a, a kind of compatriot, on again, off again lover, uh, by the name of Alexander Berkman. He's the guy that tried to kill Henry Clay Frick uh, in Pittsburgh uh, a generation before when he was a very young man. Um, and they both were there. He's running an anarchist newspaper in San Francisco um, that is not so subtly titled The Blast. And so it was, a, it was a community that was more friendly to radicalism. And so the book kind of becomes about that moment and what this particular uh, moment in time in terms of tension meant, not just for San Francisco, but really for the country. What, what kind of things could we ask ourselves about patriotism, uh, about loyalty, uh, about immigration, lots of questions that we could we could sort of ask because the story again becomes about much more than just this really tragic act, but it really becomes about um, I think um, who's responsible uh, and who are we as a nation as we kind of look for um, culpability and all those kinds of things. A couple of kind of things led me to this topic, um, and I have to confess it came from working in part with a student. We have a History 100 class, 
and it's our historical methodology course. And the student came to me, and they all have to write by the end of the term um, a paper. And um, she said, you know, I'm thinking about writing about this L.A. Times bombing in 1910. I said, wow, that sounds great. Um, and so for me, I'm interested in labor and radicalism and the left kind of in the late 19th or early 20th century. And when it's in the American West, I'm particularly happy. So that's the kind of universe I continue to live in. And so this, this, this student came and proposed the LA Times bombing. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a, a sort of famous story, um, but maybe a little undertold. And I sort of dug around a little bit and, and thought, boy, that, that's kind of a good, uh, similar kind of moment that could, could have a lot more meaning. A um, couple of books on it by journalists of late. But that digging led me to the San Francisco story, which was very underexplored um, and had two books come out about it in the 1960s, one in 1967 and one in 1968, I think, um, by journalists. Um, um, and they were writing almost explicitly about the legal battle um, subsequent to the attack. And so what I wanted to do is kind of reframe it about the bombing as this really divisive moment. And so... It, it ticked a couple boxes for me. You know, it was in the area that I and the world I kind of live in, in terms of scholarship. Um, and I, I also am really happy that it, it kind of came out of a conversation with a student that led me a couple steps down to the, to the topic. Sure. The book begins with this uh, uh, really tragic moment. And what I try to do very quickly is talk about the kind of so what questions. Why does this um, not insignificant moment, but certainly undertold story, um, this, ra this radical act of, of violence, what does it tell us about the American experience? So as, as, as soon as I can, I try to get into first the manhunt. And not just because it's an interesting story. Um, it was uh, clearly intended to be uh, a moment where the lo local kind of chamber of commerce and local authorities and so on were interested in, for lack of a better word, kind of sticking it to the labor radical community. And so um, they didn't know who did it, but they knew who they wanted to get um, known that had done it, um, if that makes any sense. And so they were looking for a particular audience. And so there was this uh, Pinkerton detective by the name of Martin Swanson who was working in San Francisco. He comes up with a list of the five labor leaders who were in town at that moment and that's who they arrest. And they do it um, without due process. They do it without legal counsel. They'll hit, they're held in solitary confinement. Um, so it's clear that the manhunt is, one, to strike a blow at labor, um, that that's the real mission um, by the powers that be. The other thing that I really spent a lot of time talking about is that the manhunt was clearly part of the context at the time, anti-immigrant attitudes. And so almost all of the folks who are identified, uh, or at least thought of to be suspects initially, um, were immigrants, um, either first or second generation, um, Irish, Jewish, and so on. And so um, that clearly to me meant something. Uh, and, it, and it says a lot about the period and, and anti-immigrant attitude. So um, that's kind of where I get to almost immediately is to the manhunt. And then the story really becomes this larger miscarriage of justice. And the, the figurehead for um, ultimately the act is a guy by the name of Tom Mooney, who was a local labor leader. And so Tom Mooney um, is uh, put in jail in 1916, uh, and he stays in jail uh, until 1939. And so the book really centers on the fight um, for justice for Tom Mooney, um, because it becomes a great miscarriage of justice. There's a huge uh, trial. It's well publicized. There's doctored evidence. Um, there's altered photos, kind of pre-Photoshop, all of this kind of stuff. And they're trying to, to put Mooney on the street at the moment that the bomb explodes. And they're using uh, a little bit of photo evidence to try to do that. Uh, there's witnesses who are telling tall tales. Um, and, um, and there is a jury who's not sympathetic to labor. And so Mooney's case becomes a very, very uh, unfortunate uh, story for him. I think the folks who committed the act might have hoped that uh, something would change. Um, World War I still unfolds, conscription and a draft still happens. Um, and so I guess the short answer is no. Um, you know, nothing changes certainly from uh, 
the perspective of anarchists and labor radicals and so on. Um, but I think what it does do is provides us a pretty powerful reminder about how we can get caught up in wartime hysteria um, and how sometimes we can misappropriate justice. Writing the conclusion, um, you know, it went, that was the thing that really mattered to me, that um, it was very obvious to me that there were parallels to the world around us, you know, from 100 years ago. Um, but it was clear in the 19 teens, patriotism was reaching a very kind of fevered pitch. And if you weren't part of that American enthusiasm, then there were questions asked about you. Um, and particularly if you were an immigrant. And so the newspaper accounts were pretty um, powerful because they would say, look, uh, it's clear whoever's responsible for this is some kind of swarthy man. And, you know, it was this kind of coded language. Um, and there are lots of examples in the book of, of those kinds of accusations and so on. I think the thing that struck me, you know, being in the archives and looking at the papers, was how much the case of Tom Mooney mattered nationally and internationally. Um, there were continual letters of support from um, kind of notable politicians and so on across the country, but even internationally, you know, there were letters from Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher, there were letters from Albert Einstein pledging support for Tom Mooney. And so I guess the thing that struck me was just how powerful the Mooney case, as it became known, was beyond um, California. I was kind of living in the California story and, and the national story, but the, the broader appeal and the way that folks worked on his behalf and generated pamphlet after pamphlet um, to free him, uh, often, you know, the banner free Tom Mooney, or um, they were these kind of uh, pseudo historical accounts. Um, and I say pseudo because they were clearly uh, coming from a particular angle um, about the miscarriage of justice. And so um, they were titled, you know, the frame up in California and, you know, justice raped in California, this kind of stuff to, to generate sympathy. Um, for Mooney. And so there was this kind of machine. There was this legal defense fund that was uh, created. And, and so the, the reach, I guess, is the thing that really surprised me uh, again and again. I have tried uh, countless times to do something outside of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era and labor radicalism in the West, and I just keep coming back. Um, it's the world that I live in. It is what I am most passionate about. I, f I feel um, the most kind of, um, I guess, uh, empathy toward um, the historical actors. I, I think as historians, um, we're at our best when we're telling the stories that haven't been told. And so um, I couple that with a sense of, uh, of uh, I guess, again, empathy uh, towards the historical underdog. And so there are a lot of those tales in this little universe from 1880 to 1920 in the American West. I'm interested in workers and rank and file folks and also Westerners. Um, and so anytime there is a, a, a confluence of those things, those are the historical actors that, I, that I'm really passionate about. I'm interested in um, the stories that haven't been told. And these are characters in the past who we haven't focused on. We have lots of books about mine owners, um, and we have lots of books about famous renegade Western politicians, and they're all important. Um, but I'm really interested in local union organizers. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the folks who are working for 20 to 30 cents an hour. Um, I think those stories in the broader context of social history and what we, we do as historians really well um, are just as important, if not more important. And also, um, I like being in the West, and I like um, Western stories. And anytime I can get to Montana or San Francisco um, to do research, then that's a nice benefit, too. What is unique about the West is that it is a spirit. Um, and people will debate, what is the West or where is the West? You kind of know when you're in the West. There are um, topographical markers or barriers. You know, it's west of the Missouri River or something like this. Um, but you know you're in the West when you're in the West. And so there is a spirit that makes it unique.
Historically, what's so interesting about the West, I think, is there are boom and bust economic cycles. There are really different demographics. Um, and so those things create a unique place and a number of places that are different than Chicago or New York. Um, I, I try to catapult myself to the streets of Butte, Montana or Caldwell, Idaho or San Francisco because I think that those streets historically have a different feel and a different identity and a different spirit um, than the places maybe east of the Missouri River. So the book um, is part of this Critical Moments in American History series from Routledge. And um, they envision these books to be targeted towards maybe undergraduates or um, um, maybe early graduate students, something like this. Um, and they're supposed to be um, these kind of shorter monographs to be used in a classroom. Um, and so on the one hand, I think the audience is um, your typical college junior um, to be exposed to this story. But also, I think telling the story is um, maybe more important than just classroom use. And so I wrote the book as best as I could. I don't think that I always got it right, but I wrote the book to be engaging. And so I didn't want the junior um, college student history major to be bored and I didn't want um, my uh, mom and dad or wife to be bored either when they read it and so um, I, it's an engaging story and so um, um, I also wanted it to be uh, um, kind of a page turner if I could if I could successfully do that